Hi, all. Uh, I am Ravi Surya. I'm joining from Bangalore. I'm your host. Namaskara. Uh, with me, I have uh, uh, Robin Gupta, who is uh, AVP uh, okay, I, uh, Innovation at Power. And uh, interestingly, okay, uh, today I came across okay, the library uh, testers. Okay, um, and that, that gave me okay, a pinch because I have never seen okay, a library dedicated uh, to automate the SaaS web applications. And this brought me to question, why particularly for SaaS? And I have the same question to okay, Robin. Let's get started uh, okay, asking Robin why and what made him to uh, come here. And let's know about this. Yes, Robin, it's, it's up to you now. Okay, thank you for that brilliant introduction. So we'll get rolling over here, okay. Uh, we'll have some questions for the audience, some polls and everything. Uh, plus, folks, please feel free to shoot your questions. Um, uh, you know, this library itself is new. Uh, I'm more than happy to take in questions and feedback. So let's keep it very interactive throughout the session. Let's not make it uh, those boring uh, conference sessions. I, I totally hate them. Okay. So yes. quick hello from Gurgaon. Uh, mm -hmm. My name is Robin. And uh, as you guys know, I'm the creator of Test Zeus. So we'll go through the slides one by one. Okay. So first, of all, let's let's have a question. How many of you have, have worked on a SaaS application, right? So it's it's a poll question as well. Um, I think Ravi Surya can have that enabled, and we can quickly see some show of hands. Okay. And okay, when we say SaaS, uh, it's not. Um, sauce or gravy as a service, it is software as a service. Okay. And for this session, SaaS and PaaS product as a service, platform as a service could be similar for us. Let's not get into that debate. Um, Salesforce, interestingly, is a SaaS offering. So if you have tested or if you have worked on a SaaS application, yes. If not, no, that's cool. Okay. We have the poll running for a minute or so. Uh, and interestingly, Oracle, Workday, ServiceNow, some of those platform applications are SaaS as well. As for me, it is debatable, uh, but feel free to count them in. Okay, I'm just seeing the results. Uh, so if more than 50% people say they have worked on a SaaS application. Okay. Okay, I think we, we have hit poll. the one minute mark, yeah, right? Yes. Okay, I'll end the poll. Uh, very interestingly, today we have a divided audience. <laughs> so 50% people say they have worked on SaaS, 50% people say they haven't. That's cool. Um, so that was more of, of a trick question or a trap. <laughs> Uh, the point of that question was that if you have worked on a SaaS application, then you know the pain. Okay. For those who haven't, great. Uh, you have been happy for the most part of your life. And, and I bless you happy days ahead. So let's get into some of those details, right? Why, why did I ask that question? So this is a sample page on a Salesforce application, right? There, are, there is this one box in the middle. If you guys can see it. It says it's communications, right? It's an account detail page for people who have worked with Salesforce or SaaS, they can relate to this. It's a representation of a record, right? Um, interestingly, there are dotted boxes on the left, right, and at the top, okay? Those are the key pieces. Now, Salesforce used to have this uh, whole, you know, campaign around more clicks and less code. This is supposed to be an application where admins, non-technical folks and citizen testers uh, and developers can create applications for the CRM users. CRM as in client relationship management. Salesforce is a CRM platform, as most of you would know. On the left-hand side, you know, they have the standard components. You can drag and drop them. It's the desktop view. On the right-hand side, for that page itself, you can edit pieces, right? For people who haven't worked on SaaS, if you've seen Bicific editors or website makers, right? This is reminiscent of that. Now, interestingly, this is great, but our whole premise is how do we test this, right? So let's move a little forward. 
uh, I'm pretty sure. So I, I don't need a poll over here. I'm pretty sure that all of us, if not most of us, would have seen this lovely triangle or the pyramid on the left hand side of the screen. Right. Now, interestingly, a lot of uh, you know people within the testing community believe that we should follow the triangle or the pyramid. Uh, there are some variations. There is a cone version. I've seen boxes and everything as well. The bottom layer being unit tests, the middle layer being integration tests, and the top layer being end-to-end -end tests. Then there is this whole cloud of manual tests as well, right? Now, interestingly, for SaaS applications, then let's get a little specific about Salesforce testing, right? So we'll not spend too much time over here, but we'll very quickly run through some of the pieces where I need to deviate from this automation testing pyramid. Okay, so there are some points on the right. Let's go through them one by one. Interestingly, uh, people who are familiar with Salesforce would know that Salesforce themselves as a platform mandates 75% coverage for the unit tests. Excuse me. So what does that mean? If me as a developer writes Apex code or writes the Salesforce code, uh, it will not hit production until I have 75% coverage for the unit test. So that is very well covered from the dev angle itself. Now, a lot of the APIs or the platform nuances or details are provided by Salesforce, right? So that's why a lot of integration tests are also covered. So let's say if we build uh, a mean application, uh, Mongo, Ember, Angular, Node, Right, or a full stack book application from scratch. We have to do the back end, we have to do the front end, we have to do the sockets and the APIs in between and ensure that all of those pieces work fine. Right. But what I'm trying to highlight over here is that a lot of those pieces are either governed or supposed to be maintained or should stick to compliance from the Salesforce platform or to they are offered as standard offerings, right? So the third point over here says that as a Salesforce developer or a Salesforce Scrum team, you need to mandatorily adhere to the UI design system. They will have this uniform, you know, blue color theme, uh, uniform CSS, uh, front end pieces everywhere. Uh, they have something called the lightning design system. A lot of what you would see on the Salesforce applications uh, sticks to that very closely. And the whole point is that similar architectural patterns exist for other SaaS applications like Workday, Oracle, ServiceNow, as well in my experience. So the big question, which we will not answer, but is, is a homework to the audience, is the testing pyramid the right approach for QA teams, testing Salesforce, and other SaaS applications? And him, maybe not. Okay. So let's move a little further. So then that brings us to the next question, right? So then what should we test on Salesforce and when, right? So I've got this model, it's, it's very representative. This is not um, the golden test strategy for every Salesforce application ever, but this is more like a blueprint or, or a starter kit for you to start looking at things from a new perspective, right? So we have the first column. What is the type of change or what is the trigger? What is the event for you? to start testing some of the pieces that you have in your application under test. And then on the right hand side, we have the layers where you should look at them. Okay. The third element in this table is low, medium, high. So when this happens at this level, this is a high risk or, you know, you should definitely look at this. This is not applicable, so on and so forth. So let's pick one example, right? Uh, let's say we look at the changes to business processes. I'm looking at row three. So changes to business processes, including workflows, non-visual flows, and assignment rules. At design level, low risk, but at unit level, high risk, system level, high risk, so on, so forth, right? So this is something which I didn't know, and I, I feel that it is important uh, for the Salesforce testers or the SaaS testers to understand from my previous slide and this one, that when you attack the SaaS application for testing, and automation consequently, you should have, have a very good test strategy at the beginning. Okay. So I'll not spend too much time on that strategy piece. Let's move towards this. Okay. Okay. That being said, let's say you figure out the test cases, 
we have everything in place. We know these 50 test cases need to be tested with every release. With every release that we do, with some releases which might happen outside with our vendors, with integrations. This looks like a job for Seaman. That's our superhero. Um, the Selenium framework that we will build from scratch, that robot will run all these test cases for us. And we will just take some vacation and have some gala time, right? That's generally the perception of automation engineers when they hit new applications, right? Oh, okay, now I've got this whole test strategy uh, in my brain. We've written these test cases. Let me fire up some code. Let me create this new framework. Have Seaman attack the problem, okay? So this is a robot. Uh, so there's nothing called a Seaman, but I wanted to give it a superhero vibe, right? Okay. However, there is a twist in the story. So in, interestingly, the Salesforce application, right, looks very calm on the surface. It's like the surface of the ocean, very calm, relaxing. So on the left-hand side, you know, we have a similar account detail page as I showed earlier. And then at the bottom, you know, it's that inspected or Chrome console piece. Now let's look at some of the problems which, you know, CMAM, our automation robot or automation engineers face when they attack SaaS applications and specifically Salesforce, right? So first is frequent system updates. Uh, in the beginning of this session, Ravi Surya was asking me, so what, you know, forced you to create this framework? So I was telling him the origin story for Test Zeus. Uh, when I met Salesforce two and a half years back, me and my team, you know, we ran a project, automated a couple of test cases, and exactly one and a half, two months later, all of them broke. Even though we hadn't done any changes from our side, but that was the harsh learning for me that Salesforce does releases twice a year. Uh, they do the spring, summer, and winter releases. And interestingly, as part of those platform releases, which are mandatory, by the way, um, they do change a lot of internals at the API level, at their own code level, but at the external level as well. So they will change the DOM structures, uh, how they will handle shadow DOMs, slots, uh, lightning web components, so on and so forth. Right? What does it mean for the QA teams? Right? Every time they do it, uh, you have to reassess most of your test cases, whether they are still working, what's the impact, um, con continuous maintenance uh, of, of not just your test base, but your automation base as well. Right? Interestingly, Salesforce also has this concept implemented of shadow norms across the application, and their norm structure is very heavy. Um, you're as highlighted by the bottom section on the left hand side that you know. I'm just looking at the drop files button, which is highlighted on, on the screenshot. And the same element is highlighted at the bottom in the DOM itself, right? This is a very small snapshot. Uh, this slide was insufficient to show the whole complexity and the DOM tree, right? And interestingly, the account is a standard object on Salesforce. So this is the easy piece. <laughs> if you have custom objects, if you have custom integrations or custom code written on top of it, uh, it only gets much more interesting, so to say. Okay. So we had the C-man earlier. We saw, okay, you know, automation engineers, when they see Salesforce or a web application in a test, they attack it with their full energy. But when that rubber meets the road and C-man enters the ocean of Salesforce automation, as I mentioned from my case, a lot of things break and a lot a lot of things fumble. Okay, so that's the origin for test zoos. That's the problem statement that we are trying to solve with this open source automation thing. Okay. So <laughs>So as I mentioned, right? So generally people attack automation from this front facing challenge, right? 
that okay let me look at the x path as i was showing earlier or let me look at the zone structure and try to see how best we can interact with those elements but interestingly what we found in our case or on sales code was that there was a back door right we thought what if we could utilize the same apis which sales code themselves use for rendering the front end right so this is a screenshot this is from the official documentation of sales code themselves they have this concept of user interface api ui api okay so the whole sales application right if we cut it into slices that is what is being represented over here let's start from the bottom and we'll go towards the top okay so we have the core platform and shared services interestingly salesforce is uh, is a system which implements multi tenancy we'll not go into those details on top of that we have the ui api so all that data let's say from the databases flows to the ui api towards the lightning data service and the application layer now this is the application layer which feeds into the salesforce ui on your chrome browser or or on your web browser right and then on top of that we have the base components right like let's say we have uh, the nine dot icon or we have this icon right and we have experience components on the right hand side so we used to work with kobio as well so people who would know integrations on salesforce they can relate to it that that whole api is actually built we get from the yeah it from the back end itself okay so the whole genesis of test zoo was the point that can we also use the same ui api to figure out which elements appear here on the ui right so that is the smart innovative approach that we took with test zoo uh, i see some folks are raising hand we'll take questions at the end um please feel free to pop them up in the chat make a note but yeah we will definitely answer every question that we get along the way okay so ui api is what we actually use for the auto locator strategy within test zoos right so rather than creating locators by hand let's look at this picture that we have in front of us on the left hand side we have the same account details page right the account owner account name phone number address prior to sla so on so forth all those fields for that record right now the same piece comes from the ui api the box on the right hand side there's too much english but don't worry about that we'll go into the details in a second over here so when we look at that screen right account details let's say it has the account name and it has an account created on right so that's a snapshot but don't worry about the data itself the ui api basically is a design system which salesforce has implemented saying that on section 1 which is for accounts row Two, which is account name column 1 we have the value for that account name right now this is much more intuitive than writing in x path double forward slash um text uh, or you know double forward slash div uh, text equal to account created on or contains or you know some um uh, access or something around that if we create that one we have to write it by hand uh two it might change with the salesforce updates or with the updates that the scrum team or the development team does now over here even if something does change the ui api will update us with the data let's say account name moves to the third place rather than the second place right so then the data that we get from the ui api will be like section 0 which is account details row 2 which is account name column 1 something like that so we'll get the precise location and you know if if you guys can imagine a little bit as we move along that is precisely what we use within test zoos to build the auto locators right we can and you know in very simple words let me simplify it we can run a for loop get all those pieces in one shot iterate through them one by one and pass on the locators to the automation stage okay rather than writing all of that by hand or it makes parts and so on so forth that same piece is detailed on the right hand side on the screen okay that we not only do we get the precise location but interestingly salesforce also sends in is it a required field or not and the type of that field right is it a text field is it a pick list drop down calendar value multi select look up so on so forth right so we can use all of that contextual information to not only one create the locator two perform the contextual action okay cool 
So that's the auto locator strategy that we have implemented in test use. Interestingly, sales has this concept of EPT, experience page load time. Okay. Um, in very simple words, if we have to wait for some element on the UI, we can do implicit weights, we can do explicit weights, and some of us would also do thread dot sleep, which is okay. We are not debating that over here. But what Salesforce does is they have this concept of experience page load time. Let's look at the snapshot at the bottom for a second, right? Next to the star icon, you can see something in green. Uh, I'm not very good with colors, but the number says 1.33 space S seconds. Okay. So since Salesforce is a managed application by Salesforce themselves, it's a CRM which they build and deploy, basically sell to their customers. They do a lot of this governance and compliance, right? So as part of that initiative, they also publish numbers that, okay, when you load this web page, it loaded in 1.33 seconds. And when we say load, right? Uh, so they do check for is it ready, the DOM is constructed, are the elements intractable, and also with some buffer frames, right? So test Zeus utilizes the same concept to automatically wait for the page to load, right? So we this is not like a silver bullet or explicit or implicit weights, but this definitely augments the waiting strategy, right? So based on the EPT concept, we have built in auto weights, which help on the waiting strategy for locator interactions and test automation in general. Here's a high-level framework diagram. Don't worry too much about it over here. Look at the code and the demo in a minute. The form figures the test engine XML, which figures the test case. The test case and base test, where we have the web initialization from the web driver factory and the page factory. Um, the test the test class also uses the page objects. So we use the page object model for custom integrations, custom implementations. The page object extends SF page base, Salesforce page base, where we actually do the auto locator magic. We get all the locators in one shot, um, create the X path or whatever is required, pass it on to the page object for the interactions, and then use it in the test case. The base test class box with item number four also interacts with email utils if you want email interactions or also uh, uses the HTTP client wrapper so that we can one, not only use the UI API data, but two, also if people want to REST or API based testing, they can write tests using the HTTP client wrapper. So that's a very um, simplified version of the framework for Tezus. It's all open source and on, and on GitHub. So we'll provide links at the bottom and at the end. So don't worry about that. But the whole device is very simple. Uh, it would be also uh, very common for people to have seen similar structures in other places. The only differentiator being that this uses the auto locators and other Salesforce specific nuances such as EPT. Okay. Okay, demo time. Uh, let me jump out of slides. I think time wise, we are doing okay. And get to our favorite place in Eclipse. Uh, I hope everybody can see the Eclipse screen. Uh, Ravi, can you confirm or can folks confirm that? Yes, Robin, I can see the screen. Okay, cool. Um, so over here, we'll do three things. One, I'll quickly show you the structure of the test case that we are running, right? Two, we will actually run it. What's the point of talking if we can't make it run? And three, then we look at the results and then some of the internals, not into too much detail, but obviously we'll see how the, the X path or the locators are getting constructed, how using the UI API and so on and so forth, okay? So basically I've tried to put in comments as appropriate. Um, in the beginning section, we're trying to navigate and log in to the Salesforce application, right? Line number 31 over here, account list page dot UI API parser record ID is the place where we actually try to get the data for certain record and record type. We are using account, but the same concept applies to um, the other subjects that we have on Salesforce, the other standard objects like uh, contact, opportunity, cases, so on and so forth. Once we have that data, we can use it 
to create new records. The whole premise of this test case is to create a new account uh, by just passing in the form values. The same can be done by API. We have a sample test for account creation by API on the test tools GitHub repo as well. So that happens in line 33 to line 40. Line 43 says thank you. Um, the second test is just to check what are the required fields. Uh, so we are seeing if, if the account account data has required fields or not. As I mentioned earlier, the UI API also highlights those data elements and exposes them for usage. Okay, so we'll quickly go ahead and run it as a test ng test. Hopefully, it should work. If it doesn't work, <laughs> we'll try something else. Okay, Tezus has uh, also utilized Maven. The same piece that we are seeing is available as boilerplate code for you to take from GitHub and run it on your own. Uh, we have the Maven dependency already set up in that boilerplate code so that you're good to go from. Point zero. What you are seeing on the screen is the Salesforce login page. Uh, people who have worked with Salesforce would have seen this, I don't know, a million times. What we are doing next is we put up the user ID and password. And once we click the submit button, we are trying to navigate to the account creation section. Okay. Um, this is the setup. Uh, again, as I said, people aware with Salesforce would be knowing this. If not, that's cool. This is more, you can think of it like as a home page. From there, we are using the nine dot icon to get the URL for the accounts directly. And on this account list screen, we have clicked the new button, which brings up this new pop-up for us to create a new account. Now these fields are the places where we are parsing all the data from UI API, not hard coding XPath and locators, and dynamically creating them on the fly. Uh, as we see, the script has put up the details, clicked on save button, the account was successfully created. We have verified those details and that's the end of the small test case. If Eclipse would work with me over here, I will quickly show you the data that also that we get. Okay, that's the moment. Okay. Yeah, on my machine, Eclipse faces some ego issues here and there. So it's not cooperating well, but no worries. We can get back to that in a minute. Okay, I'm just trying to keep Eclipse happy by not clicking too many buttons. But what I wanted to show the audience over here is that in the console, I have printed out the values that we get from the UI API. And if you see specifically uh, towards the bottom section, right? right? So from that account UI that we saw, we are parsing what is the label for that field, right? and the type for it. So for example, for SIC code, SIC code, um, we get the SIC code as the label and the type for it is string. For ownership, we get the label as ownership and the type as a pick list and so on and so forth, right? Now, example one, if we had to write page objects for that account page that we just saw, we would have to write in locators for all of these. I think in this specific case, as far as I remember, there were around 30, 35 um, fields and values. So we would have to write all of that by hand, but no need to do that because if UI API can provide all of that data, we can just store it in a hash map or a data structure as we're doing over here and then consume it for creating the XPath on the fly. So that is the difference in one, the efficiency or the velocity that you get with using test views rather than writing stuff by hand, because a lot of this is just pulled in, sucked in, massaged and parsed ready for usage. And two is the maintenance. So as I mentioned initially, if Salesforce is doing three releases an year, 
And if your development team is doing at least once release and uh, in a month, so that is 12 development releases plus three Salesforce releases. Interestingly, Chrome, Chrome driver, Chrome browser does 13 releases in a year. You would have to maintain your test cases for all of them throughout the year, right? Obviously, that wouldn't leave us with a lot of time for the other important stuff. So rather than relying on automation for efficiency, we would be stuck in maintenance hell. Okay, back to the main thread. So as we were seeing on the console, all the label and types are fetched from the UI API, and then based on that data, we basically construct the X path or the locators or perform the interaction, right? So if it's a string, we can read the value, input the value. Um, if it's a pick list, we you know we can interact it interact with it as a pick list. Uh, if it's a URL, we can have the anchor tag, we can have the value, so we can perform contextual actions as well. Okay, so that's what I wanted to show the audience over here. Um, that how are we getting those values and we are using them. Okay, that is sort of the end of the demo. Um, so we will provide the GitHub link. It's on testdoos.com. Pretty easy to remember. Uh, very few alphabets there. Um, so you can one look at it, obviously. Two, two uh, get the code for yourselves. Try it out. Right. Uh, we are more than uh, open for feedback. Um, see, poke around. See how it works. See all the readers that I mentioned in detail. Um, and four, uh, if you're happy with what you see and you feel motivated, feel free to. To, you know, open a commit request or a PR, and and we are definitely looking for contribution. So let's look at some of those angles. Okay. So the the next thing which I wanted to highlight with this session is personal experience and other footnotes. Um, Tezos has definitely helped us or helps us or helps the audience in one, as I mentioned, accelerating the test automation effort by removing the need for writing explicit locators. Right. So that's the example that I mentioned earlier. But rather than writing all of that stuff by hand, you can just use it and consume the data by the UI API and then use it for your automation needs. Two, add stability. So with automatically waiting for pages to load. So using the EPT concept, experienced page load time, we can do that. Okay. And the third is reducing the maintenance effort with the changes on the platform. Okay. The other notes over here is that TestSuite is an open source test automation framework. It's GPL v3 license, and it's a proof of work. And the target users for TestSuite are technically strong engineering teams. Uh, you would have to uh, fork it or get your own copy built on top of it. That's the point that I'm trying to make here. And uh, we are looking for contributions. So the road ahead, there's a small poem on the left-hand side, uh, which definitely inspired me. And on the right-hand side, we have some resources and support. Um, so the links will be there in the slide, which we will share. Uh, Salesforce has its own community of test automation trailblazers. So that link is there. They also provide the trailheads for learning trailheads are you can think of them as free online Udemy courses where you can learn Salesforce specific concepts. Um, we also have a selection community on Slack, which is generally a buzz uh, with feeds and questions and answers from, from the members of the Selenium community, the maintainers, and the core members. And then there's a link for the test tools repository as well. So maybe the session will come to an end in some time. But we are just getting started. And that's uh, our robot back in action, Seaman. That's also the end of the slides and the presentation. Um, any questions from, from the folks over here? Hey, audience. Uh, if we have questions, let us uh, raise your hand so that okay, I can uh, uh, let you speak with uh, Robin. Um, we can speak with Robin. Uh, meanwhile, Robin, uh, Vaibhav, I had asked a question saying you, uh, the question is uh, UI API, will we get uh, from developer or from network tab? So to rephrase this question, he's asking, uh, uh, will we get a UI API from, um, the from the developer or from the network tab? Okay. 
uh, you need not go to any of them because okay, okay let me go back and share one piece okay so ui api is something which salesforce themselves provide as a standard api okay if you look at the right hand side box over here it says that heading ui api and you can do a get to that end point on your own so get and then your salesforce base url slash ui hyphen api record ui and the record number so if you hit that you will get the full details on your own so you i personally feel that you need not approach either of those avenues for a certain record you can get the details on your own because the ui api is a standard api provided by salesforce I hope that answers the question. If not, please feel free to be asked. Ah, uh, why, Bob? Let let me know if uh, if that um, if, if I want to talk to Robin, I can enable you. Okay, yeah. And we have one more question that came up now from uh, uh, anonymous attendee. So the question says, as how about handling the dynamic objects using uh, uh, TIS? In case of web table, will I pay also return row and column IDs? uh that is a very good question in some of our cases we felt that yes it can do it um but interestingly as i mentioned as those is more at the proof of work stage so we haven't you know deployed it in the wild and we don't have substantial data to say yes but i'm also not saying no so maybe is the answer um please try it out on your instance and interestingly while we found that as those is good at handling the standard implementation what i have seen in my own experience is that salesforce implementations get complicated exponentially with time right people add in custom code custom implementations dynamic objects integrations um integrations with other platforms so on so forth so we can't guarantee but please try it out uh, and if you see it doesn't work please put it up as an issue on git we monitor it very actively and i'd be more than happy to jump on a call or look look at common use cases yes so that i have a question robin from from my side yeah uh, like how do you handle uh, the shadow doms shadow dom like yeah uh basically that piece of code is not yet added to testus but what we did initially was that uh we wrote custom javascript implementations for handling shadow dom uh and as i mentioned earlier uh salesforce has a very strict design system so if we would have shadow doms in one place they would be very similar to shadow doms across the platform for that implementation so generally with javascript interactions you go to the root open the root interact with it so on so forth nothing magical over here nothing uh, special done with test zoos but we were definitely using the standard base uh, with selenium and javascript execution for shadow dons okay so how are you handling uh, the reporting part here yeah. like so if, if i use okay this uh, this if i if i clone this git code and okay if i start working or Okay, uh, yeah. on automating the the SaaS uh, based web application, how the report seems to look. Like. Yeah, so uh, we haven't done a lot of work there. Uh, we use TestNG um, okay. for that, and I'm assuming that that would solve most of it. Okay, we have a, a question from Junaid Khan. He, yeah. He's asking, uh, does it work with Salesforce Classic? Yes. <laughs> yeah it so uh, for people who don't uh, are are not aware of uh, dunaz question in detail salesforce had their own design system called the classic and then few years back they migrated to the lightning platform um, but to the question yes it would work beautifully with the classic interface as well uh, robin uh, means, uh, to me one slide okay uh, means like two slides it looked very interesting means uh, it's interesting that's something okay which will help me to visualize the things okay that uh, one was slide 13 uh, like uh, slide 13 um, yeah 
especially okay uh, that animation okay uh, if you play okay that was a 1 2 3 4 so yeah i feel okay that's something uh, that's something very neat and that helps okay uh, uh, tester to a uh, tester or anyone who who will go through the code and the flow it will help them to see like what's happening um, uh, thanks for that so uh, one can visualize okay in the flow right there uh mm-hmm. that's so yeah that's very good thank you uh so a lot of what we are seeing over here has come from my own late nights working with code bases across organizations and this is one thing which i personally felt that when you enter a new code base right right generally people say that go debug it and start it on your own there is right. a lot of kt provided to devs so i don't want the users of pesos to hate me for that <laughs> <laughs> so the numbering might be a little off but it's 99% accurate yeah but this this looked uh, very uh, innovative and neat for me now there's no need to go and look at uh, the different yeah. packages, the packages and class i can okay, just see this and i can connect with the, uh, in the id the flows yeah, thanks for this and yeah. and one more uh, uh, which looked interesting for me is that uh, the ui api layers i i did not know that okay the web um, uh the web page of uh, yeah this one the web page of uh, salesforce application is so um, structured in the dom yeah it's, it's, so that, it's layered yeah correct um that is one thing which even i realized once i entered the salesforce ecosystem is that how well how neatly organized things are right. so i have worked with uh, home grown applications for most of my career and you know as i mentioned if you build a full stack web app um it's like this it's like this cluttered house you know you don't know where to find this thing and you know one npx update or whatever and 50 things will break interestingly with salesforce a lot of these pieces are solved very nicely it's very well structured very well documented uh beautiful diagrams as we are seeing over here this is not something i made this is from their documentation so yeah but to your point definitely that is something which we can definitely take inspiration from right hmm. so um uh, again just let me know if you have uh, any questions so that i can enable you to talk uh we can talk and uh, after this uh, talk of uh, talk from robin uh, robin will be available at uh, the at the hangout table uh, so you can go to the hangout page there and uh, join the table and you can continue to interact with robin and ask your queries okay um yeah so i'm seeing are there any questions coming in from audience okay if not uh, then uh, we will uh, catch up in uh, the hangout table uh, with robin or uh, uh, robin this was uh, in swami uh, to highlight i mean i have not worked with uh, saas applications i mean saas uh, sales force in particular Okay. I'm not working with Salesforce applications, and this was um, uh, useful for me because I do not know how the Salesforce okay are, are layered. I saw this, yeah. and I got an idea. Okay, when I okay next time when I when I write okay the flow of uh, my framework, also I will carry your idea. By mentioning yeah. your name, I I, I got this idea from Robin. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. This was a. Uh, uh, Needed needed uh, such informing uh, in terms of okay, understanding Salesforce and uh, how to present the idea of the flow of a code. That helped me a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.